Oh God, together in this place, may we create necessary space because there is no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all created wounds. In this holy space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our necessary space together and we will work it side by side. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning to everyone as we um, gather on this hot August morning and we wait the effects of Esau's coming our way. That's right, Esau's, I pronounced it correctly. As we center our hearts and minds together this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship, we hear and we read that anyone who thirsts, let him come and drink. Come and partake of the spirit that gives us life. Become a witness of God's free gift of grace to all people. 
And as they will come running to us because our covenant God will raise us up, transform us, and make us shine. And again, as we confess our sins together, let's go to God in prayer. God of justice and mercy, we admit that we're not always free of deceit. We are fooled by false promises of the world into pursuing things that do not truly nourish us. Hear our cry and save us, dear God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the good news for all of us. God is gracious, merciful, and abounding in steadfast love, and he gives us forgiveness and grace. We don't have to earn it with sacrifice because it is a free gift from our generous God. Amen? Now please turn to those gathered around you and where you're in your homes or wherever you are and greet them in the name of the Lord. Pass the peace of Christ with them and hit us up with an emoji or something this morning as we pass the peace to each other. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. next section of our worship is for our youngest disciples, those young people and children who are worshiping with us uh, at home this morning. And the first thing that I want to say to all of you is hopefully you had a chance, maybe your mom or dad or some other grown-up in your life reminded you to grab an object of love to place within your communion space this morning or um, in your sacred place. And if you haven't done that yet, you still have time. No worries. Um, but just remember, if you haven't already, right after the Time for Young Disciples, to go and find something that means love to you so that you can all put them together on your communion table for when we gather around the table virtually later on this morning. But for our Time for Young Disciples today, I wanted to go back to one of my favorite preachers and teachers, Mr. Rogers. Many of you know that I am a huge fan of Mr. Rogers, who also happens to have been a Presbyterian minister. And one time on one of his shows, he was talking with some little kids, some young kids, about what they do when they are afraid. Sometimes scary things happen in our lives, and it can be hard to know what we do when we feel that feeling inside of us, like we aren't really safe right now. And the, one of the most interesting things that one of the little kids that he was talking to said when Mr. Rogers asked them, what do you do when you are afraid or when you have to do something that is scary? And do you know what they said? They said, you hold someone's hand. Sometimes when you have to do something scary, it's important to hold on to someone's hand. Now, sometimes that is a real person in your life, like a trusted grown-up or a friend. Sometimes you hold the hand of God, who is always right beside you and right all around you, even when we can't see God. We know that God is there. And even if God doesn't have a physical hand for us to hold, we can sit very still and close our eyes and imagine God holding our hand when things get scary. So no matter what you may be going through this week, whether you feel happy or whether things get a little scary, remember to hold someone's hand. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for your love. Thank you for giving us Jesus, 
a real live person who walked the earth and held the hands of those he loved and all people when things got scary. Help us to hold each other's hands and to love one another as you love us through Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. It is the story of Jesus and his disciples crossing the sea. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped but he was in the stern asleep on a cushion and they woke him up and said to him teacher do you not care that we are perishing and he woke up and he rebuked them rebuked the wind and said to the sea peace be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to the disciples, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were all filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the seas Obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, there was a quiet little village in the French countryside whose people believed in tranquility. tranquility. If you lived in this village, you understood what was expected of you. You knew your place in the scheme of things. And if you happened to forget, someone would help remind you. If you saw something you weren't supposed to see, you learned to look the other way. And if by chance your hopes had been disappointed, you learned never to ask for more. So, through good times and bad, famine and feast, the villagers held fast to their comfortable traditions. So begins the story of the villagers in Lanskine, whose world was forever altered by their tumultuous, transformative relationship with an unusual newcomer named Via. Rocher. 
Via and her young daughter arrived in the village on a winter day. On that same day, an unsettling north wind began to blow. In the Caribbean, we have a name for this, La Tramontana, the wind that changes everything. Many of us have made the beaches our home and made community our church home because to us, this place feels like paradise. We appreciate the tranquility, the beauty, the sanctuary that this community offers us. This is a place where we feel safe. And for a long time, maybe even for our whole lives, things have made sense to us in this place. We've been comforted and reassured, encouraged, and maybe we've even grown to believe that this is a community where we won't have to encounter many of the ugly, unsightly, or uncomfortable things that go on in the world over there. In recent weeks and days, we have come to realize in shocking ways that even here, we are not immune to the storms and suffering of life. Two weeks ago, an officer was critically injured and a suspect shot in a parking lot less than a mile from our church. Earlier this week, our church itself was broken into and vandalized. Families in our community are devastated and have suffered losses from a global pandemic, a pandemic that doesn't care what zip code we live in or how pretty our view is or how nice we are to one another. To use the words of my predecessor in ministry, we are living in mighty times. A tramontana wind is blowing. It feels like a storm. It is changing our entire world, erasing our places of safety. And it is terrifying. The events of the disciples crossing over to the other side had some great thoughts for us this morning. You see the stages of team develop. Jesus gave them a task. He said, a command, go to the other side. Twelve men from diverse backgrounds, social, racial, and political positions. Most of these guys would never associate with each other outside their own little small group. You had fishermen, a couple of political extremists, Nationalists, a couple of them were described as just pure pessimistic. And of course, you had the tax collectors. You had men from all over the land. A great storm has come up, challenging each one of them personally and as a team. Can you imagine, just for a moment, if you would, all the emotions and the reactions in this situation? These men were fearful for the safety of their own lives. A situation like this causes all kinds of emotions and reactions. The fight or the flight uh, reactions kick in. Possibly all kinds, of, in the boat, you probably could have heard all kinds of complaints, demeaning comments toward each other, and some anger. There was probably discussions about turning back or maybe altering the course until after the storm. As team development goes on, they left on land what we call the forming stage, that stage of coming together for a shared purpose. Jesus told them, go to the other side. And now they're in what we call the storm stage, literally. And it's easy to follow when things are back in the forming stage because your leader makes all the decisions for you. But now, Jesus knew that these men would be the leaders to carry on his work after he's gone. He needed for them to become a team, to trust each other, to support each other, and to work together, especially when things get tough 
like they knew that they would in the first, the first century of the Christian church. When Jesus wakes up, he doesn't say, whoa, what have you got us into here? He doesn't call out anybody's name. What have you done? He doesn't say, let's go to shore and just kind of wait this thing out and then reassess the situation. He looks at him and he says, uh, and he also doesn't say any accusations toward anyone. He doesn't call out anyone in particular. He does his part, his role in this. He just steps up and he says, peace, be still. And they keep on going over to the land that they were called to go to. There's some questions that come up about why Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat so soundly. Here is a storm raging all around them, and Jesus is sound asleep. Some discussions look at, well, perhaps he had the confidence in the disciples that they didn't have in each other, but he knew they could do this. He'd given them this task, and he had confidence they could do it. So he was in a very restful, peaceful sleep. I look at this story, and it speaks loudly to me about how God has called us together as a church with all of our diverse backgrounds and all of our differences. He's given us a task to go out, to go and to do ministry to the other side. And now a great storm has risen up. If you think about it, just dealing with, with the COVID pandemic, for one, with all of its anxieties surrounding the tensions of just taking care of loved ones, with just going out in our daily lives and our activities can bring a lot of work, a lot of effort, masking, social distancing, and everything. Trying to get ready to go back to school with all the anxiety and the decisions that surround that. There's a storm that we're living in right now just in that pandemic and even more. People are tired. People are angry. People are confused. They're probably wondering the same things the disciples did. Why doesn't God do something about this? Melanie mentioned the two events that happened around here, and those events have not happened in this community in over 20 years. The, the situation at the Panera, the police officers told me it was over 20 years that something like that's happened, and now I know I've been at the church for 20 years here, and we see what's happened this week. This shows us the effects of the storms that we're living, that we're sailing in. The events from Mark's gospel relates to us and how we work surviving this storm. The disciples didn't give up, and they called out to Jesus. Well, we're in, a, we're in a boat together, and we too have differences. God has given us as a church family a command, a task. And as our leader, he hasn't forgotten us. He was with them in the boat that day. He was with us as well. We started out this year on our task of doing a ministry, and a storm rose up around us. And with all the challenges that face us, do we let this storm sink us? The disciples were given a task, and Jesus asked them, why are you afraid? Why are you such of little faith? And perhaps we have to answer the same questions. He knew that these men had to learn to work together. These men had to get past their differences, past their fears, past all the things that separate them, and they had to come together to take the gospel out to people, reaching what we call the now, the norm stage, and the performing stage where real work and progress can happen. The challenge to us is that do we stay the course working together? How do we respond in the middle of this storm? Maybe our faith is shaking a little bit, maybe a lot, but this story is about going on from here, becoming a stronger team where real progress can happen. And we know that one of the places where we put aside, or we bring, excuse me, all of our fears, all of our strengths, and, and along with all of our differences, all this meets up right here at the Lord's table this morning that we're going to share in communion. The table featured prominently in the story of our friends in the French countryside as well. When Vian Rocher arrived in the village of Lanskinet, she was met with curiosity, suspicion, even open hostility from many of her neighbors. They believed that if they could just stop her from doing the things that she was doing, or avoid her, or make her go away, 
their tranquillité would return to them and life would go on the way that it had before. But that is not what happened. In the end, Via did not leave the little village in the French countryside, and their tranquillité did not return to them. Although she did eventually win over some of her neighbors with her relentless hospitality to any and every person who walked through her doors and her ability to disarm people with the delicious creations that came from her kitchen. Love poured out in chocolate. It feels like it was not an accident, that it was around her table that the people of this tranquil village began to see that the very things they feared could, if they let them, make them strong and vibrant and resilient people. The same is true for us today. The world right now feels unrecognizable. We cannot make sense of it. Waves of uncertainty are coming at us fast and they are not stopping. The Holy Spirit is moving through our safe places like the wind of the Tramontana, changing everything. Over the next several weeks, we, as we move through the fall, we will begin an exploration of our church name and our church mission. We will ask ourselves, what does community mean to me? Right now that might feel like a difficult question to answer. Maybe the meaning is changing, like so many other things around us these days. As we sit here this morning, and in the weeks to come, we may feel like Jacob, wrestling with God as we try to reconcile all that we see and all that we feel around us. We may feel like the disciples in the boat, overwhelmed and grasping for any sign of safety. The good news of this moment is that like Jesus, there with the disciples in the boat, God's love is already right here. It is within us. It is all around us. It is between us when we are near each other and when we are far apart. It can be easy to miss in the chaos, but it's here. And maybe today, our simple call is just to try to move toward that love. It is that call that brings us to the table. We are called to meet one another here, to care for those who are in pain and suffering, to welcome those who are desperate who are different, and who feel alone. We are called to live grace and forgiveness, and above all things, love. Just as God has given us freely grace and forgiveness and love through Christ. When all else fails, this is our safe place. This is the place where God's love is poured out, where we can all start again and again and again, as many times as we need to, where we are filled, where we are known, and where we are loved. Amen. As we continue to prepare our hearts and to get ready to join at the table, we go to God and we bring ourselves, we bring ourselves and all that we have 
to, to not only to God this morning, but also to service to our friends. And we bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts. We bring everything about, about ourselves. So the past few weeks, I want to give you an example. The past five months, I'm going to hold this up if I can. We have been on a, a mission, a shoe mission. We've asked everyone to bring up your tired, your worn out shoes. And we take those shoes and we sell them. And the name of this little brochure is called Why Shoes. And we sell them. And, they, uh, and then they take those shoes, they refurbish those shoes, and they give them out to developing countries, to people in need in developing countries. So we started this five months ago. This week, we received a check and our certificate of appreciation, uh, of achievement, excuse me. Um, and we have raised, and we raised $1,932 for our Father's Housewares missions here at this, at this church. We want to thank all of you, and especially Diane Russell, who leads us up. But we also want to thank each and every one of you for the ways that you give and the ways that you support the missions here at this church. Let us pray. Again, O oh God, we bring all of ourselves, everything that we have. And we know that you blessed us above and beyond all that we could ask or think. So as we bring ourselves, we bring our gifts, we bring our tithes, our offerings, and even our pieces of clothing. We ask that you continue to use those, those what, we, what we bring to you to show your love to the world around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
the table this morning. A long time ago, 12 men gathered in a room upstairs, fearful, doubting, all kinds of differences between them. But each one were invited to come to the table to see how love is shared, how love is poured out, and how service to others is, is exemplified. We too are called to the table of the Lord with every little thing in our lives that's wrong and everything in our lives that is right. We were to bring ourselves to the table where we see that love is poured out and how service to others is exemplified. You're welcome to come to the table this morning and join with us. So on Communion Sundays, we do our prayers for one another in a slightly different way. This morning, before we begin our communion prayer, I'd like to read just a few of the many prayer requests that we have from within and around our community of faith. We do our best to get every single name on the list, and we hope that we have done so. But if there are any that we missed, know that though we may not pray for you by name today, we still pray for you in our hearts. And above all, God knows and sees all that you need. This morning, we pray for Andel, who we've been praying for in recent weeks. We give thanks for a successful surgery, and we know that there is also a long recovery ahead, and so we continue to pray for her healing. We give thanks that Caroline, another member we've been praying for, had successful surgery and a better than expected outcome. We give thanks for God's healing and for your continued prayers. We are so thankful for the continued recovery of Bruce and Phyllis. We give thanks for Lisa, who celebrated a birthday this week. We pray for comfort for Joe and for her family as they mourn the loss of Joe's daughter, Judy, this week from complications due to COVID-19. We give thanks for Jeannie, mother of Diane S., who celebrated her 90th birthday this week. And we pray with Terry, who is in a coma and on a ventilator after complications from COVID-19. We pray for all those in addition to these two that we lift up who have been recently affected by COVID-19, including Wayne, Rosa, Samantha, and Vanessa. And we ask that God will help them to heal quickly and completely. We pray for all those facing medical challenges, especially Chris and Nancy, Mike, Kathy, Margaret Ann, Phyllis, Damon, Karen, Shauna, Cindy, Betty, Libby, Jenny, and Chip. We ask that God will wrap God's loving and healing arms around them. We pray for those who are having surgery or are recovering from surgery or medical procedures this week, including Jeannie, Ron, and Annie. We pray for those facing cancer, including Judy, Jeremy, Dave, Carol, Rick, and Ricky. We offer a heartfelt thanks for all prayers answered. And we pray comfort for those who are struggling with anxiety, who feel alone or isolated in nursing homes or elsewhere, especially Virginia, Steve, and Anne. With all of these things in our hearts and minds, we come to the table. We come together from all of the far-flung places that we are this morning to meet God here. When we feel like there is no safe place, God invites us to meet one another at the table. Here God says to us, when you are broken, angry, hating yourself or hating others, when you feel that the world is shifting around you, when you feel abandoned or afraid, I will be your home. I will make you whole. Let us pray. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of Christ our Redeemer to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, 
that we may eat and drink and be filled at your table, that we may witness to you, O God, that we may be willing to follow your spirit and bear your love, keeping the commandments which Christ has given us, that your spirit might always be with us. Mighty God, who speaks the word of peace to calm our troubled sea, caring God, who nudges us away from fear and toward love, ever-present God, who fills us with awe and also raises many questions without easy answers. Open our eyes to see you in our boat today. Strengthen our hearts for the challenges that lie ahead. Open our ears this hour to hear the word you speak. This we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the last night of his life, he sat down together with those he loved and he shared a meal with them. And after the meal was over, he took the bread from the table. He broke it apart and he gave it to them saying, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, and he gave thanks for it. And he poured it out, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is the new covenant, poured out in my blood, which has been shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. My friends, each time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen.
us pray. It is all about you, Jesus. The gift that you gave to us so long ago. Gracious and loving God, you've taken now these elements that are common and you've made them a sacrament for us today. You've set them apart for us and to empower us. We too are common. Help us to reach and empower us to help the world around us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The days before when we were able to come together in worship in person we used to end our worship services by standing together and holding one another's hands today I think it is a good day to try to do that wherever you might be whatever that might look like in this moment Whoever you are worshiping with this morning, reach out and hold their hand. And if you cannot hold the hand of the person standing next to you, just sit very still and imagine them holding on to you. Imagine God holding on to you. And know that even when we have to do scary things, we are never alone. May God's love go with you, Christ's grace surround you, and the Holy Spirit's fellowship connect you in all the ways you need it this week and always. Amen. <laughs>